I know what Emperor Palpatine seeks to accomplish, and he will not have my cooperation. Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed in Bad Batch Episode 11, Metamorphosis. Now, this is one of my favorite episodes of the Bad Batch this season, and it's probably not a coincidence that it also connects to the larger story of Star Wars. This episode is a sequel to one of the best Clone Wars arcs ever, and it leads up to... Somehow Palpatine returned. Oh, is that it? You're not gonna like play the real clip? That is the real clip. This episode is actually a building block that is explaining the sloppy plotting of the sequel trilogy, and I am very excited to break this down for you. Let's begin. I keep pointing out how various episodes of this season are influenced by classic movies, such as Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, American Graffiti, Westerns, and this episode draws a lot from the movie Alien. If you haven't seen Alien, well, what the hell are you doing watching The Bad Batch? <laughs> Go watch Alien. Alien is about a group of space truckers who investigate a new life form that ends up stalking them through their ship as it grows and mutates. In fact, the head of the monster in this episode bears some resemblance to the monster in Alien. But more than that, the episode's dark corridors, claustrophobic feel, and music all seem like homages to Ridley Scott's sci-fi horror classic. In fact, the crew in Alien find the monster on a crashed ship, just like the Bad Batch finds the Zillow Beast in this episode. Hey, how come the troopers on the ship look weird? Why, the, why are their uh, eyeglasses glowing? Well, Doug, that's because these are no ordinary clone troopers. These are actually clone commandos. We first saw them in the 2005 game Republic Commandos. They were elite clone troopers throughout the Clone Wars series, and we've seen them in the Bad Batch before, notably in the last scene of the first season when they escort Nala Se to Mount Tantus. And what is that, please? So, Tantus first appeared in the original Expanded Universe story, Timothy Zahn's Thrawn Trilogy novels. It was a mountain filled with the Emperor's massive cloning facility. Thrawn used the cloning cylinders to create clone soldiers, and it's where Luke fought an evil clone of himself. All just, look, guys, they're great books. 10 out of 10 should read. Last season, the Bad Batch introduced Tantus into the new canon. After the Empire stole the cloning tech from Kamino and destroyed Topoka City, they brought Nala Se here. Now, there was another Expanded Universe story called Dark Empire, where Palpatine did return as a clone, which was later reused famously in Rise of Skywalker. Now, that movie did very little to explain exactly how Palpatine returned, just this. Cloning. Secrets only the Sith knew. So now we're seeing other Star Wars stories lay the groundwork for that. For instance, in The Mandalorian, Dr. Pershing harvests Grogu's blood. Moff Gideon says what he wanted the blood for. Bring order back to the galaxy. And we see bodies in cloning tanks, all of which are probably showing the earliest efforts to clone Palpatine. Yeah, I never really understood all that. Like, like who was Ray was his granddaughter? And oh, uh, well, actually, I can explain all that for you. Wow, it's JJ. Hey, can you explain the rise of Skywalker to us? I sure can. Thank you. You see, it was easy for Palpatine to create a clone of himself, mm -hmm. but the difficulty was in creating a clone that could be force sensitive yeah. and that he could transfer his mind into. All right. Oh, okay. You see, clones don't have many chlorians in their DNA because they're artificial. Yeah. And as we all know, the force only exists because of microscopic life forms in our blood. That's nice. We all love that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Ray's dad was a clone of Palpatine, but he was imperfect, and that clone escaped and met Ray's mom. Oh. So when you mix her DNA with Palpatine, you get a person that has Palpatine's blood, but can also be force sensitive. Uh -huh. And that's why Palpatine wanted to take over her body in Rise of Skywalker. Get it? I guess, but... Yeah, why did it... Oh, no, you go, you go. Why couldn't Rey have just stayed no one? I mean, she didn't have to be Palpatine's granddaughter to make the movie work. It's like, it's like you added in a twist just to one-up Last Jedi. Man, I get this shit all the time. I don't need this. I'm gonna go remake Jaws. Bye, JJ. Now, regardless of what you think of the sequel trilogy, this episode is genuinely cool as hell. So let's get back to the breakdown. Anyways, remember the patch on Pershing's arm? That matched the patch on the young Jango Fett clones in Attack of the Clones. And it's what the technicians wear in this facility. So I think this patch marks them as part of like a cloning or a strand cast guild. The episode introduced a new villain, Dr. Hemlock. Now, Hemlock is a poisonous plant made famous when Socrates used it to commit suicide while he was in prison. I couldn't help but think of that when Hemlock was visiting Nala Se in prison. <laughs> and I'm sure all of you remember that Nala Se was the Kaminoan that we met in the Clone Wars, who was basically raising Omega on Kamino. Now, if Hemlock's voice sounds familiar, it's because he is voiced by Jimmy Simpson, who you might know from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Westworld, or as Lyle the Intern on The Late Show. Anyway, f you. Maybe you should climb out of my butt. Here it seems like Hemlock used to be Nala Se's apprentice. It's been a long time, Mistress Se and Nala Se is understandably reluctant to help the Empire. 
I am not especially motivated to continue my work after the Empire destroyed my civilization. Hemlock tries to appeal to her love of science. Know that your research remains intact. And he implies like all that cloning stuff that JJ talked about. It'll now serve a higher purpose, the Emperor's purpose. Which is the exact wrong argument to make. I know what Emperor Palpatine seeks to accomplish. Then we go to the Bad Batch who, like the monster, were recently stranded. Their conversation with Sid starts to show how their relationship with her is fracturing. Now, a few episodes ago, Tech noted that Sid's criminal past was going to cause them trouble. This is not the first time she has required our assistance due to her dealings with individuals of questionable integrity. It is a problematic pattern. And they reached the end of their patience a couple episodes ago when she left them stranded, and then in this episode won't even compensate them with more money. I'll even give you 30% of the cut. That is our standard percentage. So this is all laying the groundwork for future problems. Here, they talk about leaving her, but they're worried that she's gonna sell them out. Severing ties with Sid could be problematic, considering what she knows about us. Now, in the episode Faster, Sid was also surprised that Omega showed her any loyalty or compassion. And this episode does end with the tease that the Empire is going to want to hunt down Omega. So my guess is that Sid will eventually sell them out, but then maybe turn on the Empire at the last minute just so she can help Omega. Anyways, it's a good thing for the Bad Batch to leave this Job of the Week for Sid format. They do say this will be their last mission for her, and the episode ends with a tease that they're finally going to join the larger fight with Echo and Rex, but more on that later. So the Bad Batch find the ship. Again, very alien. Omega says, This is used to extract and manipulate a host's genetic material. And Dr. Pershing used a similar device on Grogu in The Mandalorian Chapter 3. And it turns out that the monster they're looking for is a Zillow Beast. There's an early clue to this with the droid here. Because we saw one of these droid models working for the geneticist in the Zillow Beast Clone Wars episode. Yeah, you keep saying that. What's a, what's a Zillow Beast? Ah, okay, well some of you have probably seen the Zillow Beast episodes of Clone Wars, but in case you haven't, here's a very quick refresher. So, during the Clone Wars, the Republic was fighting off a Separatist force on a planet called Malastare. The Republic wanted the Dugs on that planet to sign a treaty to join the Republic so they could use the fuel from that world. But the droid army was surrounding their position, so the Chancellor approved uh, basically an A-bomb, but for electronics. The bomb created a massive crater unveiling a huge Zillow Beast at the bottom. Or I bet after this episode, the Republic used that droid bomb all the time. Nope, never heard from them again. Why not? Well, I think it's because Palpatine didn't want an easy victory. He wanted to draw out the war for as long as possible to give himself... <laughs> and as we see in this episode, the beast feeds off of electricity. So it's likely that it was just hibernating underground for thousands of years, but this electric bomb woke it up. Anyways, the Zillow Beast scales are impregnable to blaster fire and lightsaber blades. So the Jedi and the clones manage to shock it till it collapses, kind of like we see in this episode. But then Palpatine, by special order, wants the beast studied further. Where is this controlled environment? On Coruscant. Master Windu, you and General Skywalker shall safely bring the beast here. So, these episodes are classic kaiju stories. Like King Kong, they bring the monster from its native habitat into a city. And then, like in every Kong and Godzilla movie, the monster goes on a rampage. In this case, the Republic is trying to study the monster so they can replicate its armor. The Chancellor says this is for their ships, but we really know that he wanted to create armor that was impregnable to the Jedi's lightsabers. Because he is always prepping for Order 66. Exactly. So, the monster goes berserk, typical kaiju, and eventually they are forced to kill it. But the episode ends with a little tease clone the beast? And we're finally getting the follow-up on in this episode. So, like I said, Tech and Omega find the lab, and they recognize the Kamino and Tech has been altered. Cloning technology, but this configuration is different than anything I saw in Topoka City. And this is because the Empire is assimilating Kaminoan technology with their own systems. We see similar behavior in Andor, where they ripe out Aldani culture so they can build an airbase. Omega also says, I think whatever they were doing was happening off-world. Which explains a lot. Now, we saw one abandoned off-site Kaminoan base last season. What does he want me for? You already know the answer. So if the Chancellor ordered the Zillow Beast to be cloned in the Clone Wars, then it makes sense that this work would have been done at another facility aside from Kamino, because they were transporting the Beast to Tantus. And one of these off-site cloning worlds would have been on Exegol, where the Emperor was finally cloned in Episode 9. 
The panel here looks like it was used to monitor the Zillow's life signs, but the Arabesh reads a status breach. My guess is that it fed off of the electricity of the ship, and then the clone troopers used these prods on it, which only made it more powerful. In fact, when the Zillow Beast escaped on Coruscant, it did so by feeding off of these power generators, but it wasn't as obvious then. So it's very likely that the Empire had no idea that the electricity would help the monster to grow. Make my monster grow! This is where the episode gets its title, Metamorphosis, because the creature is going through a physical change. Could it not also mean the metamorphosis of the Bad Batch from a team of heroes for hire into a squad of clone liberating commandos? Yes, it could mean that too. High five. The Arabesh on text readout here looks like a lot to translate, but really it just spells out your mom. So the creature escapes and goes toward this quaint mountain village, which looks modeled after some place from the Swiss Alps. It's a very cool design detail that checks all the Star Wars boxes of familiar and new. This adds a ticking clock to the story, something that the show has sorely needed for the past couple episodes. They were stuck in a cavern, they were looking for their ship, but nothing felt like very pressing. But here, time is running out because the monster is going to eat the children. <laughs> But then the Empire shows up. Their capital ships are Venator-class cruisers from the Clone Wars, and the fighters are V-Wing starfighters. And I love how they make the same sounds as the fighters that will eventually replace them, the Imperial Ties. The starfighters are escorting these Imperial gunships, which are similar to the low-altitude assault transports that we first saw in Attack of the Clones. The vessel that eventually captures the Zillow Beast is the same type that was stranded earlier in the episode and that escorted Hemlock to Tantus. So, I'll assume that it's some kind of cloning research vessel, but I don't think we've seen the like of it before. If I'm wrong, let me know down in the comments, because I know you will anyways. But if you tell them to make a comment, it seems like it's their idea. Shut up, dude. Onlookers here include several Star Wars aliens. We have an Arcona, a Twi'lek, an Aqualish, a Pantoran, and a Rodian. The Empire lands troops with a new class attack shuttle, typical from the Clone Wars, and begins to round up all witnesses for questioning. They also destroy the ship to eradicate all evidence, because you know what? This would be the Empire's most closely guarded secret. Palpatine would not want anyone to know about his death contingency plan, because it's basically like his Horcrux, his key to eternal victory. The Imperials chase away the Marauder, and maybe it's the 80s kid in me, but spaceships and stars over pine trees always make me think of E.T. When the Zillow Beast is finally trapped, the Arabesh here reads Zillow, while the letters on the left read scale because they're trying to determine what makes their scale so tough. And then the Bad Batch start to piece together what has happened here. The directive came straight from the Supreme Chancellor before he became Emperor. So I think we're starting to see the Bad Batch put together that Palpatine has actually been using the clones since the war to facilitate his own rise to power. This is why I think they will eventually lead the clones in a rebellion against the Empire. Palpatine was one step ahead of us during the war, and he's still several steps ahead of us. And we've got lots of Arabesh here. It reads, Specimen A, arms, legs, and hands have extreme dexterity. Layered scales, high density armor, armor in normal state, armor plated tail spike, tail can be used as a weapon, high adrenaline, no lactic acid, threat level six. And the next slide reads, Specimen A, Zillow beast growth level six, high adrenaline, heart rate 300 BPM normal, lactic acid zero, high density armor, eating state, layered scales, advanced vision. So after Tech discovers that Palpatine was behind cloning the Zillow beast, Hunter seems pissed. Send the data to Echo and Rex. See what they can find out. So now that they're starting to put together that Palps has been using the clones, Hunter is getting ready to join back up with Rex and Echo to protect their brothers. And then the episode ends back on Tantus when former Kamino Prime Minister Lama Su arrives. Lama Su first appeared in Attack of the Clones where he met with Obi-Wan Kenobi. This army is for the Republic. And he basically rats out Omega, saying that the Empire will need her, so Nala Se will help clone Palpatine. Cloning. I can't wait to see how this comes together, with a conflict with Sid, with Crosshair, and the Empire hunting down the Bad Batch. Although the Empire still technically believes that the Bad Batch are dead, so the question is, is Crosshair going to rat them out and tell them the truth? They left on fair terms at the end of the first season, but Crosshair has chosen the Empire over his former brothers. Well guys, that's all the Easter eggs we found, but if you found any, let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.